Okay, good afternoon. Today, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Roger Butel. Roger Butel is the founder and the CEO of Capital Economics, which is a very well-known uh, company in London. And he wrote um, two years ago, I think, Roger, uh, or three years ago, this uh, fantastic book that I have here with me, The AI Economy. I really recommend, as I did already in our sharing knowledge group, this book, because it's a very, very good reflection about the implications that the book that the ai will have in the future the book has this um, epinomous work wealth and welfare in the robot age so thank you very much Roger, for your disponibility to be with uh, this portuguese group of uh, participants i think they will enjoy your keynote and then as usual we have uh, an open uh, discussion trying to see what is in fact the future of uh, artificial intelligence. So the word is you and wait for you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm only sorry that I couldn't be with you physically in Portugal, where I suspect the weather's a lot better. Um, I like coming to Lisbon. I haven't been for a while, actually, but uh, I've been many times. OK, so first of all, let me begin by saying that um, for my sins, I'm an economist. I'm not an expert in all the intricacies of AI. So the task I set myself in this book was to ask what I thought the implications were of AI for the economy overall. So it's really a book of economics about the implications of AI. You mentioned that um, the book was written a few years ago. In fact, would you believe it? It was written, well, it was published four years ago, actually. The paperback three years ago, but the original book four years ago. So I was doing the research on it sort of five and six years ago, immersing myself in a lot of reading. And I'm so pleased that I did that because it got me up to speed with so many of the issues that are being discussed now. I mean, over the last few months, the subject has just exploded. Unfortunately, uh, I had done a lot of the relevant reading some years uh, ago. Let me briefly say something about the shape of my remarks today. First of all, I want to start by talking about what all the fuss is about. Why are people so worked up about AI? What's different about it? I'm going to say a few things. You might think it's out of place, but I don't think it is, about the Industrial Revolution, a historical perspective on, if you like, general purpose technologies. Um, I'll say a few words about what sort of jobs I think are going to be threatened by AI and what sort of jobs might be created by it. I'm going to have a word about the future of driverless cars, about the prospects for increased leisure. I'll say something about the impact of AI on education, something about which countries I think are set to benefit most of all from it. And I'll say a few things about um, inequality and the implications of public policy. Okay, so let's get stuck in. Um, why, what's all the fuss about? Well, um, I have to say, looking back uh, through my reading, a few years ago, what was very obvious to me was that AI has been through marked cycles in its brief history. That's to say, there are periods when people get ultra enthusiastic and investment and attention pours into AI. Um, the possibilities get talked up. Some people might say hyped up. And after it fails to deliver, people lose interest again. If you like, it goes through alternations of feast and famine. Soon after my book was published in 2019, something of this sort happened again, because when I was researching the book, AI was all the rage. And there were lots of books coming out with titles like, they're coming for your job. They meaning robots and artificial intelligence. Um, and the prevailing mood, by the way, was intensely negative. People were prevailingly worried about what AI spelt for humanity. Um, and pretty much soon after my book appeared, um, the subject fell flat. There wasn't much interest in it again. And I don't think it was because of my book. I don't think I can be blamed for that. I think it was partly due to the fact that some people had claimed too much for AI. A lot of it was to do with COVID, I think, and the... Um, um, the impact of, of lockdown. Now, more recently, of course, we've had this great flood of interest 
I think really occasioned by the launch of chat GPT and uh, people thinking about what that could do for everything. But even so, we've still got some intense skeptics on the scene. The American economic historian Robert Gordon, for instance, calls large language models stochastic parrots, which I think is a lovely expression. He's a big skeptic. So why all the fuss? Well, I think at bottom, the idea is that this artificial intelligence is potentially so powerful that it can replace human beings in everything that human beings do. Uh, and that therefore, without much extension, it could potentially wipe us all out, either wipe us out economically or wipe us out directly, physically. Um, and linked to this, you read people who on the whole aren't economists say things like, well, you know, all human labor is replaceable by robots and AI. What's more, these things, let's call them things, although, of course, AI is a non-thing, uh, don't need to be paid. They don't receive pensions. They don't go on strike. They don't have employment rights and so on and so forth. How on earth can humans compete? Worse than this, AI can constantly improve itself, which then leads on to the point where it surpasses human intelligence, that point being known generally as the singularity. Now, when I first started reading all this stuff, I must say I was immensely skeptical. And then I started reading some views of people I, we well, can't do anything other than tremendously respect them. Stephen Hawking, the astronomer, physicist and mathematician, said in 2014, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Lord Rees, the Astronomer Royal, 2015, said the point at which AI achieves superintelligence is, quote, our final hour. Well, who am I to challenge these people's views? I mean, they could be right. But I have, I have to say, in thinking about practical issues, I don't think that's the right way to approach things, because even people like Hawking and Lord Rees say this could be hundreds of years into the future, <laughs> or sometime never. So how are we supposed to take account of this in practical issues? Well, I think as practical people, whether we're governments, individuals or households, we should go about ignoring it. That's to say we should, we should concentrate on the practical issues of the here and now, of which there are plenty that are relevant. And for a start, investment in AI and robots is far from costless. It may not, they may not receive pensions, but all this stuff is immensely expensive. I'll come on to driverless cars in a moment. And I'm quite confident that human beings, at least for a considerable period of time, will find areas where uh, they can compete with robots and artificial intelligence. So um, I said I'd say a few words about the Industrial Revolution. Why do I think that's relevant? Well, because although, of course, there weren't robots or AI involved, when the Industrial Revolution happened, and it could be happened over a long period of time, it was a process, people were saying many of the things that people are now saying about artificial intelligence. That's to say it'll wipe out all jobs, it will impoverish people, and, of course, for particular individuals who um, lost their jobs or their skills became redundant, the Industrial Revolution was a terrible thing for them as individuals. And that even applied to particular trades and industries and even some regions. But we know, looking back, the overall history is quite simply that during this period in which machines came along and apparently threatened people's employment and livelihood, in fact, overall, on average, over a run of years, people became better off. Total employment did not collapse. It increased. Real wages did not fall. They increased. So this was the process that went on for a long period. And I have to say, I think this is the starting point for all of us now. We have to ask ourselves, why should things be so different from that? And in this process, of the Industrial Revolution onwards, all sorts of jobs were created which people had never, ever imagined before. So um, let's think about jobs. What, where are the jobs that are most at risk? Well, I was going to say, I think, many manufacturing jobs, but I think lots of those have gone already. Um, and 
maybe that's not the area that's most at risk now. The area that's most at risk, I think, is routine, mental and administrative jobs, identity checking, retail, standard repetitive work in accounting, law and consulting, translation. All these areas are going to be areas where large numbers of jobs are going to be lost. Uh, but one has to be, I think, just a bit cautious here because I remember when spreadsheets were developed, there was a widespread forecast that spreadsheets would eliminate the need for accountants. Now, in fact, what's happened is the employment of accountants in the United States since the advent of spreadsheets has gone up dramatically. So... Um, those are some of the jobs that are most at risk. Where will jobs be robust? Well, for a start, all sorts of practical manual things, partly because robots are still not very manually capable. Home help and domestic assistance, carers, entertainment and leisure, basic manual jobs in electrical maintenance issues. I think these will actually do comparatively well. Interestingly, from a sort of class inequality point of view, I think this revolution is hitting more parts of the middle classes, whereas previous advances in technology definitely tackled some of the lower skilled people, lower down the income distribution. This is somewhat different, I think. There'll be all sorts of new jobs created. Where? Well, for a start, if there's one thing that artificial intelligence will never be better at, than human beings, it's being human. They will never be better than human beings at being human. Now, I think there are all sorts of areas where human beings desire, and you might say even need, interaction with other human beings. And I think all those things are going to lead to a takeoff in jobs. Education, I'll come on and talk more about education in a moment, but the interaction between teacher and student, all sorts of advisory roles, issues about personal relationships, issues of service. Do we really want to be waited on by a robot? Do we want to receive medical advice from an AI program? I think the answer is no, we do not. And moreover, there will be lots of jobs created within the AI sphere itself. We all know that AI is potentially quite dangerous with regard to its ability to create fakes, fake messages, fake identities, fake everything. And the result of this is that there's going to be, it's already beginning now, a massive industry acting against that, trying to prevent it, trying to sift through um, identities, voices, pictures, trying to discern what is genuine and what is fake. And the regulation of this is going to lead to umpteen jobs as well. So I said I was going to say something about driverless cars, um, and I will do that now, um, simply because I think it's an example of excessive hype. If you listen to the people in the industry, they've been banging on forever, well, not forever, but for you know, 10 or 15 years, about the idea that driverless cars are just around the corner. And of course, the truth of the matter is they're not around the corner, they're here already, and they perform reasonably well. Although it has to be said that the tests involving them tend to take place in places like Arizona on clear roads with wonderful weather and so on and so forth. And the number of times that we're told, well, oh, the driverless cars are wonderful, but there's a safety driver in there. Was, I think uh, we have a problem. Sorry? Can't hear you. Go on, go on. Everything is fine. Yeah, we okay. are hearing you. Okay, yes. okay, okay. You can hear me? Okay. So yeah. uh, there's a safety driver in the car in case something goes wrong. Well, my point is quite simply, so long as you have to have a safety a driver in the car, these things are not driverless at all, and they're worse than useless. These things only make a real difference when they're so reliable that you don't need a safety driver in the car. You get into the car, you tell it where you're going, you fall asleep in the back seat, you get drunk or do whatever you do. As long as there are safety drivers involved, these things are utterly useless. Then there's the whole question of safety, which of course has been improved to some 
considerable degree, but it's still very less than perfect. One of the results of anxiety about the safety of these things is, I think, going to be that the more and more driverless vehicles we have in big cities in difficult conditions, the default position will have to be, when these things get into trouble, to stop. This is a recipe for urban gridlock. What is the way out of this? Well, the way out of it is to redesign cities for driverless vehicles. And if we did that, maybe these things make a huge difference. But we're not going to do it, are we? The cost is just simply astronomical. So I think this is an example of fantastic hype. What we're going to see is driverless vehicles, which we've had, by the way, for decades at airports, driverless shuttles, uh, driverless trains. We're going to have that sort of thing, driverless ferries in driverless agricultural vehicles in very narrow confines. But the idea that all of us can simply get into a driverless vehicle to go anywhere, tell it what to do and go to sleep. I really think it's for the birds. I think it's a bubble waiting to burst. Now, um, I've talked about jobs. Those are going to be lost. New ones are going to come along. Um, but I want to say a few things about leisure. And the most important thing for me to say is I think a, a general attitude to AI, where I say so many people, including many economists, have been very negative. They were negative a few years ago when I thought about my book, and I think they still are predominantly negative. They see the threats. Now, there are some threats and dangers, and I've hinted at some of them, fakery in particular. But very few people seem to concentrate on the possibility for productivity improvement, which is what all this is about. If AI can perform tasks currently performed by human beings uh, more cheaply, more readily, more quickly, then that is going to enhance our productive capacity. The people who used to be employed doing those things will have to find employment elsewhere, but that's been the history of the world since the Industrial Revolution and beyond. And I think it could still be the future now. But we now come against, up against something quite important. Supposing, supposing that AI, as it develops, does increase productivity dramatically so that our productive potential greatly increases, what will we do with all that extra income and wealth? Well, we may simply go on as now, just enjoying all that. But that hasn't got to be the case. And in 1931, my hero, John Maynard Keynes, wrote an essay entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, in which he forecasted in 100 years' time, the average person would work no more than 15 hours a week. And this was the result of an increase in productive capacity. Nothing would have to do with AI, of course. What he was saying is that as people get potentially richer, a large part of this extra income they're going to take out in the form of increased leisure. Um, well, it hasn't happened, of course. I mean, actually, average working hours have diminished substantially since the Industrial Revolution. They've developed, they've reduced substantially over the last 60 or 70 years, although not in the last... 10 or 15 years very much. But I think this is what's going to happen. My vision of the future is that we are all going to get a lot richer. I know it's difficult to conceive that in this period now where things seem to be very grim, but I think the potential for technology to enrich us is definitely there. We're going to get richer. And some of that I think we will take out in the form of increased leisure. So I envisage a shorter working week. Um, I can readily see the emergence of the three-day weekend over the next decade or two, uh, and a shorter working year uh, with increased holidays, more time off work, more leisure. And of course, to the extent that people and countries do that, that will reduce the amount by which overall production goes up. I'm not suggesting it won't go up, I think it will go up, but we will take the benefit of this increased productive potential, I think partly in the form of increased leisure. Now, I said I'd say something about education, and I want to um, remedy that now. There's been a lot of lot written about the impact of AI on education from all sorts of points of views. I mean, one strand in this debate suggests that in the new AI world, kids should just learn STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, I must say... I really don't believe that's right. Uh, as I indicated earlier on, what I think the development of AI is going to do is not only make us all richer, 
but remove from humanity the need for doing all sorts of drudge jobs. And in the process of all this, I indicated earlier on the human factor, people wanting to associate with other human beings, the human realm in all its aspects is going to increase. And it seems to me to be rather odd, if that is going to happen, to concentrate only on STEM. What about all those subjects which traditionally have been about the human realm? That's to say the humanities. I believe that um, the humanities should continue to form a substantial part of a broad education. And that's going to be important, not just for the development of human beings, but important also for the shape of the economy, because so much of it is going to be about the interaction between human beings. Then there's stuff about the way in which we are educated. A lot of people became pessimistic about um, the outlook for educators, teachers, thinking that they could all be replaced by artificial intelligence. I don't think that's right at all. What I think is likely to happen and should happen is that the best teachers should use a lot of artificial intelligence, but there should still be substantial room, indeed increased room, for human interaction and exchange with students. Now, let me say education is, I think, one of the most backward parts of the whole of society. If the Greek philosopher Aristotle were to come back to life and were to reappear in a classroom or university lecture theater, I think he would say to himself, goodness gracious me, things are exactly the same as when I was around more than 2000 years ago. That's to say a teacher stands in front of them, pontificates, uh, people write notes, uh, and that's it. This is extraordinary, it seems to me, absolutely extraordinary. What AI and all its manifestations should do is make the teaching job more interesting and more beneficial. Learning should be done by artificial intelligence and interactive artificial intelligence as well. Artificial intelligence can both set the questions and mark them, mark the answers. But then where does the teacher come in? The teacher comes in in the human interaction with the student. After the students learnt all this stuff, more discussion, more exchange of views. So I think what we're going to see is a move towards more one-to-one -one tuition. Less and less of a teacher standing in front of a class of 30 or 40 children or students or whatever and banging on and reading out their lecture notes, which I think is for the birds. I'm shocked that it's been going on even for the last 10 years, never mind in the future, and more personal interaction. Now, let me move swiftly on. I said I'd say something about which countries will do well from AI and perhaps which won't. I think the first thing to say is that clearly countries are at very different stages of development with regard to the development of artificial intelligence. The clear leader is the United States, China, uh, possibly not that far behind. Um, countries like Switzerland and the UK, pretty well placed. And the first thing I want to say, the most important thing to say is, you haven't got to be a leading producer of AI in order to benefit from it greatly. It's rather like computers, you know, not that many countries in the world are leading producers of computers, but lots of countries, most countries, just about all countries, use them. And it's the big issue deciding the impact of AI on prosperity is going to be this one. That's to say, to what extent do countries allow the full use of AI and to what extent do some of them try to squash it, over-regulate it, over-restrict it? And I think there will be some differences between countries in that regard. Um, I think it's got to be a slight worry that the EU may incline towards over-regulation. The United States, I suspect not. Switzerland, I suspect not. And the UK, I suspect probably not. Um, I said I'd say something about inequality in public policy fairly briefly. A lot of talk around to the effect that um, if artificial intelligence is as powerful as its proponents say it is, the impact is going to be catastrophic on inequality. People losing their jobs, only having, if they're only jobs at all, they're, you know, sort of road sweeper type things, not paying very much money. I don't necessarily think that's right at all. The devil's in the detail. There are all sorts of areas where artificial intelligence can do really rather the opposite. That's to say it can make human beings more productive and empower them. And it's very interesting the way that, to me anyway, that so many of its benefits are going to occur in the service sector of the economy, where 
traditionally productivity growth has been very weak. We simply don't know how it's going to impact inequality. I think we just need to sit back and see. The last thing we should be doing is making public policy to squash artificial intelligence on the grounds that it's going to make us all much more unequal. Rather, what we ought to do is let, let AI have its reign. Of course, it has to be appropriately regulated, but let it create prosperity. And then the issue is, who owns, who owns these benefits? And to what extent can governments, if needed, um, tax them and redistribute some of the benefits more widely? That's the approach I would take. A lot of people have talked about the benefits of a universal basic income. That's to say states dealing with this issue by just agreeing to pay a certain sum of money to every every individual per week or per month regardless of any qualification that's so you haven't got to be unemployed you haven't got to be sick you haven't got to be old everyone gets it just by virtue of the fact they're there this is idea has had a long and distinguished pedigree going back over centuries i don't think it's a very sensible way forward the costs of it are astro astronomical actually the amount that needs to be dished out uh, dished out to everyone from Bill Gates downwards, by the way. Bill Gates would get his universal basic income under the pure model, which I think is, and Jeff Bezos and all the others, which I don't think is a very sensible idea. I think we'd do better to refine existing methods for redistributing income uh, rather than going down that route. So let me bring matters to a conclusion. Um, pessimism versus optimism. There are things to be worried about, in particular, fakery and the ability of AI to mess up all sorts of things, not just for the sake of gaining money, but for political purposes too. The impact on elections and the political process is potentially damaging. So there are all sorts of things to be worried about. But in general, as far as the straightforward economic impacts are concerned, I don't think it's something to be worried about. It's something to be celebrated. This is just another version of what we've been going through since the Industrial Revolution. That's to say, the emergence of new technologies which destroy some jobs and create others in the process enriching us. There will be winners and losers, as there were in the Industrial Revolution. And we have to, as a society, I think, be careful, which we were not in the Industrial Revolution. We have to be careful to cushion the impact on the losers and make things better for them. There will be no shortage of jobs overall. There'll be a change in the job structure. And I indicated, I thought that um, there would be human beings can choose if they wish to take some of the benefit in the form of increased leisure. And I think they will. And in particular, I think the three day weekend is coming. It's not that far off. Thank you. Roger, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting reflection on the very widespread dimensions of AI. We have here with us lots of people that are uh, expert or at least <laughs> are followers of AI. I will start eventually with uh, Erlino Oliveira, if he, he doesn't mind. Erlino Oliveira is one of uh, our um, more well-known experts on AI. He is a well-known uh, uh, professor, engineer, and researcher. Erlin, do you want to make some comments or some uh, question to Roger? You have a different dimension from him because he's an economist and he put here other dimensions, but eventually you can put uh, any question on that or comment, please. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jaime. No, well, thank you for the invitation to, to be here and to, to say a few words. Uh, in, in general, I'm in full agreement with uh, with uh, Professor Botu. Uh, I think I think he, his, his points are, are rightly made. I will just make a couple of comments, one of them adding to his views and one of them just making a quick note. Uh, I think the increment in productivity is really one of the good things about AI. I think we should I think we should be more hopeful that the increment in productivity will help us than worried that we'll have people out of jobs. I think I think I, I'm well, if I understood correctly his position, I, I fully agree with that. In the case of Portugal, this is very important for, because one of the limitations of Portugal is exactly the low productivity of our economy. So any increases in productivity are very welcome in Portugal. And I think Portugal is well placed to benefit from this if, if we can, of course, train people and, and, and teach people how to use this. Um, the, the other thing that I think it was not referred, but I think it's important is 
AI because of this increase in productivity also addresses a problem or helps addressing a problem which is lack of qualified human resources. Since every professional will has the opportunity to become more productive, we, we can address some lack of uh, qualified human resources. And this is a second problem that Portugal has because our economy is not so competitive and our salaries are lower. So by increasing productivity and, and addressing the lack of qualified human resources, I think AI has, is a good opportunity for Portugal. It's a good opportunity for all countries, in, in fact, but I think for some countries, it will be even more important than for others. I think I'm fully aligned with Professor Roger Butler on this. Just a note on the on the um, self-driving cars. I, I fully agree also with the analysis. It's a difficult it's a difficult application area because these cars have to be very very safe. It's not enough that they drive correctly 99.9% .9 of the time. That that's that's. I mean, if it drives nine. 999 kilometers and then crashes on the thousand is not a, a very useful car. However, there is a there is a there is a silver lining. There are already a few cities, including San Francisco and some cities on Arizona, on there are driver driverless cars driving around mm -hmm. for a few years. Way more than a number of these cars. Usually they do a good job. Sometimes they stop in the middle of the street for for no well known reason, but in general they have been very safe. But I, I, I think that to be a very, very common technology in all cities in the world, I think we'll have to wait a few years, a few, maybe even a couple of decades, because because the the, the, the precision has to be very, very high. So they have they have to be not only as safe as humans, they have to be significantly more safe than humans. And we are still a few years from that, bearing some unexpected. Development, so many things. But in general, it's just a note that I'm I'm in full agreement with with uh, Professor Bottle. Uh, one thing he did not make a reference to, but I can, is that the worry is that there will be you know a takeover by by artificial intelligence systems taking care of the world for us and relegating humans to second class citizens. I think uh, it's non-existent now, and I think it's a very distant worry. In the, in the next decade. So I think that is that that worry has been overblown and people are worrying about the wrong things and maybe not worrying enough about the right things, which is disinformation, deep fakes, uh, information yeah. bubbles and stuff like that. Thank you, Jaime, and thank yeah. you. Yes, yes, time. thank you, Arlene, very much. Uh, Roger, mm -hmm. you, you don't mind if I got two more comments and then you can no, make please, a comment on please, that? Please. Okay. We have here with us also Rogério, that is the CEO of a very important insurance company here in Portugal. Rogério, do you want to make some comment on the artificial intelligence, on what Roger, Professor Buto told? Rogério, I don't know if you are... Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I was mute, actually. No, okay. um... Well, I could, I could actually make a comment, and I think, honestly, um, I, I'm also not a technologist, let's just say, although working in technology at some moment in my in my professional life. No, I, I, I think your comments were very interesting, Roger, because clearly you are... You we are, are not seeing you, Rogério. I don't know, to, I don't know if you have oh, the camera sorry, working. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I, I, my mistake. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank your, you. your comments were very interesting. Clearly, you are... Um, a bit optimistic about the the potential effects of this but in in reality and i think erlindo also mentioned this in reality we're still a bit far away from probably getting to a point in which it really becomes dangerous for us um but but we don't really know as we are now we don't really have a full picture about the potential of this technology meaning yes it's clear now that it can help it can can really enhance the capabilities of 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 professionals and of human beings and that is a, a certainty that is a certainty but it's 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 not it's too early to say uh, that it will not end up in many many functions really replacing people for sure it is also not clear how many new professions will come up out of this so there is i would say, I would say that it's not a question it's more a comment i think it's 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 safe to say that there is a lot of uncertainty uh, at this at this stage, and there is no need for us to be too pessimistic about the potential of the technology as we speak, because the the potential impacts on the economy are probably in the short term going to be more positive than than negative. 
that that's that's basically my take of what you what you said and i actually believe uh, i actually agree with you on that on that one okay okay Roger, thank you very much and finally for the first set of comments we have here rudy, rudy Diaz ferreira that is a well-known entrepreneur and now he's doing a doctoral program on ai rui do you want to make some comment questions so that we can pass to roger yes please Jaim. thank you uh very quick ones first to uh, say thank you to Professor Bootle. Uh, it's uh, um, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, topic and uh, we learn a lot from you. Thank you. I have two simple but uh, kind of uh, complex uh, questions. You, you, you talk a little bit about the history of AI. You talk about the cycles and uh, the, some winters. I, I believe it is the expression. Uh, Professor Lynn Oliver also talks uh, frequently about the winters of uh, uh, AI. I personally believe that this uh, um, current uh, hype regarding generative AI is not yet the next big thing, the, 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 big, the big appearance of uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence in our economy enough to really uh, take it to another step so in, in for for you professor as an economist uh, uh, the next cycle if you can divide the the, the 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 development of ai in cycles how much years it will take to the next one this is the first question the second is about the productivity improvement that you also talk about uh, i recently read some reports here in Portugal, for instance, envisioning 5% increasing GDP per year in the next years. I, I don't believe it. Uh, do we have any estimation for the, the next decade, uh, for instance, for Europe or for UK, uh, for the impact of AI in the economy? Thank you. Okay. So, Roger, Professor Buto, if you can comment on this three. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Notes, Excellent. Please. Excellent questions and comments. Thank you very much. And by the way, um, I, must, I should have apologized at the beginning for not being able to speak to you in your language. And I'm no, no, not to worry. speak my language so well. Um, English, okay. English if, I can, <laughs> if I can go backwards, um, if, if I may, on those questions, we ended up with an interesting point about productivity growth. I can comment on that. Uh, 5% seems to me to be per annum, that is for the birds in the West, in either America or Europe. This is much, much too high. But my company, Capital Economics, did a fair bit of work on this recently, looking at other technological advances. And the ICT advance of whatever it is now, sort of 20 to 30 years ago, I think you can reasonably imagine that may well have increased productivity growth by something between... 1% and 1.5% per annum. And I think you know, if AI is as good and as widespread and as effective as the proponents allege it's going to be, that's the sort of order of magnitude I think we should think about. In that it's you know, increasing the annual growth of productivity and therefore economic growth by something like 1% to 1.5% a year. Um, now, that may not sound very much, but actually... It is because, um, you know, compound interest gets to do its work. And in not that many years, that's taken to be a substantial increase added to what the underlying increase was anyway. Now, recently, of course, it hasn't been very high, is it? Anywhere between a half percent and maybe two percent, something like that. So maybe this is going to increase productivity it's going to result in productivity growth being of the order of three in the best countries three and a half at the outside rather than two and for the weaker ones being one and a half possibly two percent rather than a half or uh, zero that's i think the scale of the transformation that we can reasonably expect the working through the questions um was asked about you know how long till the next stage of the ai cycle uh, that connects up with another comment by, I think, the same speaker, or perhaps it was the previous one, about the enormous amount of uncertainty. Indeed, there is so much uncertainty. I can't tell you about the um, 
uh, length of time to the next stage of the AI cycle. I have a suspicion that we are entering another one of those overhyped periods. We've made an advance with chat GPT and associated things. We've made an advance, but I suspect it's not quite as enormous as the uber optimists claim. And I just wonder whether there couldn't be a bit of a sense of disappointment sort of one year, two years down the line that we haven't achieved something more dramatic. That's been the history of AI, as I said, these waves of optimism and pessimism. And when you get disappointment, it's worse than that may sound because then people become very negative about it and the flow of funds is not there for new investments and so on. So, um, On the point about eventually AI becoming some, so powerful that it eliminates us, I don't want to disparage that idea. I think it's possible. Um, I suspect it's a long way off. And there are, there are, I think there's a distinction here which needs to be made. One is that AI is set up, or if you like, programmed in such a way as to be destructive of human beings and human interests. And possibly that could be done by a human being constructing AI deliberately, or it could be done unintentionally. That's to say the thing is developed in such a way that that is the result, although the original progenitors of it never wanted that to happen. All that's possible. But that's something quite different, really. This is a distinction that needs to be made. Uh, I think something quite different from what, for want of a better word, I will use, I will call the development of consciousness. Can we imagine AI actually having this remarkable thing which human beings certainly have, consciousness and self-consciousness. Can we actually believe that? Such that what follows from that, of course, is intention. The power of intention. Could these things develop an intention and a will that they currently clearly haven't got, whatever they do at the moment, is essentially pre-programmed by human beings? Can they develop an independent will? Um, and this is a subject in the literature much disputed. Uh, I'm very skeptical about this. Uh, and I, I write about this towards the end of my book. I think the sort of intelligence that human beings have, which of course is not perfect by any manner of means, but it's the intelligence which has got will as part of it, consciousness. I think it is intimately connected with our physicality or to use another word, if you like, with our incarn incarnation. I suspect it's the way, our way we think is intimately bound up with that. So I suspect that um, AI will never develop in that way, is my guess. I could be wrong. But the earlier thing I talked about is still eminently possible. That's to say, either intentionally or unintentionally, human beings develop this thing such that at some point or other, they do all sorts of awful things that overwhelm us. I think that is, I think it's definitely possible. I suspect it's not with us imminently but i think it's i do not dismiss it i think it is a a live danger um on the question of, again of uncertainty is all this uncertain of course it's uncertain and how do we react to uncertainty well one way is to throw up our hands in the air and say, oh it's uncertain <laughs> i don't think that's very helpful myself um the world's always been uncertain um we have somehow or other to try and see our way through it. And we don't have many guides, but I think history is a guide. And I, throughout my career, placed a lot of importance on history, both economic history and social and political history. And that's why I talked about the Industrial Revolution. So much as what's been said now was being said then. Um, and uh, although we, we, there's a real uncertainty about the what AI is going to do, its capabilities, I accept that. But as regards the economic impacts, although it is uncertain, I think we've got a reasonable basis for drawing some conclusions. I want to give you an example of something um, which I think is relevant. Let's take medicine, doctors. Now, medicine is an area, and surgeons, medicine is an area where there have already been fantastic advances. 
robotic surgery for one. Um, I've had such an operation myself. And someone said, um, oh, you've been operated on by a robot, have you? That's what the various press reports, how they put it, because it's not quite true, is it? I mean, there is a robot there doing all sorts of things more accurately, more reliably and more quickly than a surgeon could do without the robot. But actually, the person at the, there's a person at the end of the robot, namely the surgeon. Diagnosis. I think this is an area where AI can play an enormous role because it can sift through an enormous amount of material, far more than any ordinary doctor can. It can remain up to date in a way that um, a doctor can't with all sorts of stuff about symptoms and treatments and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, does this mean that doctors are going to be redundant? I really cannot see this. I'm supposing, you know, you've got, you or I, you've got some ghastly symptoms. We've got some awful pain in the stomach. Um, we can hardly walk. Things are really grim. And we report not to our local doctor, but we report to our AI surgery. who We interact with, with some sort of screen, a bit like this. It asks us questions and it whirs, makes all sorts of noises. And at the end of all this, it says, well, Mr. Bootle, I'm afraid you've got a very serious condition called... Burr. And the result is you're going to have to have your right leg amputated. Um, do you want to proceed with that this afternoon or can you wait till next week or whatever? I don't think many of us are going to sit there and take that, as it were, lying down. Oh, so yes, Mr. AI. OK, thank you very much. I'll have my right leg amputated. I don't believe it. There will have to be a medical intermediary. Let's call him a doctor standing between us and the AI. We are not going to submit ourselves to these life-changing decisions on the basis of something that emerges from a computer or its equivalent. We're just not going to do it. It goes back to what I said earlier on about human beings, human beings wanting contact with other human beings and trusting them. And I finally will make another comment about driverless vehicles. I think the reason I focus on driverless vehicles is I think because they're really interesting because um, there have been enormous advances, as one of your speakers said. You know, there are parts of California and Arizona where there are large numbers of these things driving around perfectly well without incident. So there have been real advances. However, there's also massive overhype. That's what makes it so interesting, trying to strike the right balance. Now, I think one of the aspects of driverless vehicles that is potentially really dangerous, and this goes to the negative aspects of AI we were talking about earlier on, is the possibility for the system that controls driverless vehicles being taken over by terrorists. I mean, it's one thing for uh, an individual terrorist or a group of terrorists who you know, drive around in cars in San Francisco or London or whatever with the objective of killing a few people. It's quite another thing to imagine a whole fleet or all vehicles in a country being misdirected by a malevolent form of artificial intelligence or human intelligence using uh, driverless cars. This is potentially extremely dangerous. Um, so I remain very skeptical. Okay, uh, Roger, we can make a second round and then we'll finish. We have here with us Ana Paula Reis, that is an entrepreneur and well connected with the uh, technology and innovation. Anna, do you want to make some comment and a question to Roger, please? Hi, uh, thank you, Jaime. I, I would like to make uh, some questions. More, yes, okay. I think it's, it's inevitable. Uh, of course, there are fears, but uh, we will have to face them and, and put into place and work on it uh, and not, as you say, doom and gloom and, uh, and all that. My question is, um, I think that speed here is even more important than before. So the speed of implementation, speed of adaption, uh, and their education has a huge role because we are mm -hmm. thinking, we are discussing this issue here, but still, I think that probably we are the one, two percent of people that really are concerned about that all over the world. So my 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 question is, what can we do to spread the world, to educate more people? Because as I've mentioned, speed is important. Uh, countries like Portugal currently, I think, could benefit immensely from uh, serious implementation uh, of AI on the correct matter. But that implies a lot of political, institutional policies that would like that to happen. 
So the other question is, what role models are there for us to follow? Uh, probably, I, I was not thinking, that, okay, the US is more advanced, but are there niche uh, examples that we should look at and follow uh, to see where we could actually um, go? Um, and the last thing is, what advice would you give to us, in particular to in entrepreneurs uh, in this space? That's it. Thank you. Okay. So I don't know if Josh Gomes, that is um, also an economist and a professor of economy, and usually also studies these topics of technology innovation. Josh, I, do you want to make any comment or question to Professor Roger Butel? Uh, are you listening, Josh? Okay. So, Adi Franco, are you still with us? Do you want to make any comment to Professor Roger Butel? Me? Hello? Yes, yes, please. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, Professor, uh, for uh, the excellent uh, presentation. I, I really agree with uh, almost everything you, you, you said. I have here uh, three topics, very quick. Uh, the first one is, is I, I am an optimist on AI and I, I think we should move forward because in this technology waves, if we don't move, others move. And that is something we, we need to do without knowing every impact. But the first one is considering data is the raw material of AI and mm. China and India have a big source of data because of the, popula the, the number of the population. Mm. How can, in your vision, how can we uh, in the Western, and especially in Europe, where our societies have different cultures, they, they are similar in some aspects, but they are very different in others. How can we approach the, the, the question of big data to feed the AI revolution in your in your view, because this is will be an economic topic. The second, I, I really agree with you. Uh, if you can just make some more comments, I think the, the question of distribution of income I mean, is the essential question. Who go to make, where goes the income of, uh, of the AI? Mm. Who, who get yeah. the output of AI in economic yeah. terms? And mm. is capitalism system cap uh, able to develop this kind of distribution in our societies in order mm. to avoid AI will be another kind of concentration of capital, which yeah. put in case the middle class and democracy in our society. That's the second comment. And the third comment, is related to education is my 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 topic of work, AI and education in the last years. I think the I agree with you that the interaction between teacher and, and, and students will be the key point for teachers, but as in coding, I think one of the <clears throat> the and I would like to to hear if you, you have a comment on that. One of the problems is we are looking for AI to replace some of our tasks. But what I think we need to do, it is to learn about AI, not only from the technical point of view, but also from the ethical point of view, from the social point of view, because if we go for explain the AI or the way how the AI, the algorithms work, we need a public opinion. We need a citizen opinion on the, the main, uh, function of each algorithm, not only on AI in general, but each algorithm and be able to have a social control over the function. That's the, the three points uh, more concern related. But in general, I, I fully agree with your line of thinking. And I already bought the book this afternoon. <laughs> I will go to okay. it. Okay. It was a very good suggestion. <laughs> okay. I don't know. To finalize, we have also with uh, Manuel Maria Correa, that is also a manager of a big company in IT and in uh, technology in uh, Portugal. Manuel, do you want to make some comment? Any question to Professor Butel? 
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, no, not not at this point. So I I do I do also align on on the on on the on the information that we have been sharing on on this call. And thanks for that, Rogers. Uh, very interesting. Um, I think I'm I'm also a positive on on the topic. So I think AI will help us to be more productive in the country, etc. I I still have some concerns. How as 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 a country can we compete? Uh, with other countries, with our, have biggest investments, more resources, etc. That's also what it was mentioned here. So my main worries are the ones that were discussed uh, here during this this last hour. So I just uh, okay. take this opportunity to to thank to thanks the to thanks the, the the debate and and all the information. Okay, thank you. So, Professor Bruto, you can uh -huh. now comment, and then we will conclude in time as yes. usual. Well, thank, thank you very much. By the way, I think I'm right in saying that there hasn't been a Portuguese edition of the book there have been various other foreign editions there's a chinese edition actually it's quite funny but, uh, because we will try to work on that okay we'll try to work on that there have there have been portuguese editions of from our previous books actually not all yes 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 anyway. i've um, confirmed that okay there's a variety of questions i won't be able to answer all of them um someone mentioned about speed and um it's a very important point to raise every so often you pick up the viewpoint that the speed is frighteningly fast, and this is one of the things that's going to overwhelm us. I know why people say this, but you know, I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's quite right. Um, I, I, certainly, all sorts of previous technologies have been pretty slow, really, whether it's steam engines or light or whatever. That's to say, the new technology coexists simultaneously with the old technology for quite a long time. Now, I quote an example in the book which I, I find very amusing, uh, but I think it has got some wisdom in it, which is of a friend of mine arriving at Heathrow Airport about three or four years ago uh, and used to having huge queues getting through the man-made uh, man uh, passport control. And there, since then, of course, there were all these banks of um, digital control where you simply show your passport, you put it on the screen, and suppose it lets you through. And she came through one late at night, this is say four or five years ago. <laughs> and there were even enormous queues, even more than usual. And she inquired why this was. And um, the answer was that the nearly all of the automatic passport machines had been closed down. And she said, Well, why is that? And the answer she got was staff shortages. And she said, Hold on a minute. I thought the whole point was these machines were supposed to do away with human beings. Ah, oh, yes, came the answer. But the trouble is not everyone can use them very well and people get stuck in them. They make mistakes in using them. And the result is you need actually human beings to deal with the people going through the automatic passport machines. Now, <laughs> I thought that's very funny, but actually uh, it accords with my own experience. Now, ultimately, it's already happened actually, these things have got better. And ultimately we'll need hardly anybody uh, any official, but it, actually to get to the position where you really need next to nobody, it takes quite a long time. And I'm hopeful that as AI moves through society and through the economy, I don't think it'll be at breakneck speed. I think it'll be fairly gradual, actually. And that's important because it gives us time to adapt. Um, and the economy does need time to adapt and people need time to learn new skills, do new jobs and so on. Um, uh, a question about education. How do we educate people to uh, cope with AI? It's a good question, but I'm not at all convinced it's the right one. Uh, I mean, there should be, no doubt, some parts of ordinary education which help people to cope with this. But I'm wondering about ICT. I mean, there were in your country, presumably, as well as this country here. Schools eventually latched on to the importance of computers and they started teaching computing skills. But is that actually how uh, most of us learnt to use a computer? I would argue that it isn't. Actually, people largely taught themselves. And that's certainly true with regard to mobile phones and all the things that can be done with them. There were no classes in how to use a mobile phone. Uh, people just picked it up. They taught themselves. I think a lot of what's got to happen will be of that nature. And then it also goes back to what I said earlier on about um, 
human beings and the human realm. So I think a large part of what all this is going to do is to put increased importance on human relationships and the human realm. So what education has got to do, I think, is to find those aspects of employment and societal interaction, which are still going to be very, very much about human beings and the way they interact, uh, and train people for that. You see, and so my point about humanities, um, okay, they're going to be job losses, and a lot of jobs currently done by human beings are going to be done by some form of AI. Does that mean we should end up learning an awful lot more about AI? Well, I'm not sure it does. I think it means we should learn, learn an awful lot more about human beings and human interaction, because that's where our jobs are going to be. How are people going to interact with each other? Now, in the last sort of 50 years, or maybe the last 150 years, uh, it's been possible for large numbers of human beings to be barely able to speak their own language, never mind other languages, to stand on a production line and do something like this or that, um, mumble something rather incomprehensible, and it hasn't mattered. Well, those jobs are virtually all gone. Similarly, the ones that are in the mental equivalent, that's to say in the accounts department, you know, inputting data or scrabbling through files or piles of numbers or whatever, they're all going as well. Uh, so it's very important that what we teach because of AI is human skills, because that's where the future for human beings is going to be, dealing with other human beings. Role models. I can't think of a suitable role model, I have to say. And someone mentioned the United States. Um, well, there are aspects of all this where the United States is doing terribly well. Um, certainly in advancing AI in the universities and the big companies, of course, it's in the lead. But we don't know, do we, about how the United States is going to deal with the economic and social impact? We don't know. Uh, and I think it's not a good example, actually, for us. When you look at the distribution of income in the United States and how people at the bottom end are treated and what they undergo and how much support or lack of it the state provides. I, I don't think the US is a good example, actually. I don't know that we've quite got one at the moment, unfortunately. The question about big data, that was an interesting one. You know, China, huge economy, India recently surpassed it in population size. Does that give an advantage that the rest of us can't hope to compete with? Well, it's possible, but I think my question is, how big has the data got to be to get the advantage of big data? Um, it's not necessarily 1.4 billion. Maybe you can gain uh, many of the advantages at much lower numbers. I suspect you possibly can. And then also, it depends what you're using the data for, but um, if it's all sorts of predictive things about human behavior, it's quite possible that the predictions you make scanning the big data from China might not apply to somewhere like Portugal or Britain or America or whatever. And of course, there's a negative side to what's going on in China. That's to say the capacity for the Chinese state to do all sorts of nefarious things with regard to the control of individuals. I'm actually quite worried about this. Um, and my own view and my company's view on China is actually quite negative. We think that due to a combination of natural slowing down of growth, but also the efforts of the state to poke its nose into every aspect of society, Chinese growth rate is going to slow down quite considerably. And AI may be as much a part of that increasing surveillance as it is of something that's going to boost the Chinese growth rate. I was asked about entrepreneurs, you know, what was there to do? I must say, I, um, I think this is a very tricky area, not least because of this thing I was mentioning before about AI winters or feasts and famines and the danger of hype. It's, I think, quite easy to get drawn into the excessive hype about AI and to be investing in all sorts of things which then prove to be not very good money spinners. I've already given you driverless cars, which I think is overhyped and it's a bubble that's going to burst at some point. Um, there's one thing, I did mention it briefly before, where I think there's big opportunity um, well, there are two areas, actually. But the first one I thought of was what I talked about before was um, anti-fakery. If this development is producing all sorts of fakes, which it is, and it's going to, that's going to increase, then there's going to be a massive opportunity for various businesses to prevent those fakes 
to sift the fakes from the real things, to shut them out. All that stuff is going to be big. I like to think of it in terms of war. Every event, every advance in history in offensive warfare has been met by an advance in defensive warfare and vice versa. So I think this is a big area of opportunity. And another area is what was talked about before. Um, see, let's say all the ethical aspects of AI is going to give rise to all sorts of ethical problems. And I guess, well, whether it's companies or certainly individuals, people are going to be employed in uh, trying to assess those things and trying to find a way around the difficulties. Um, I think there's going to be lots of jobs in that, actually, lots of jobs, because we're not going to want AI to mark its own homework. That's to say we're not going to want AI to be regulating AI with regard to ethics or anything else. It's going to have to be human beings. <laughs> um, I think that's going to be a really big area. OK, Roger. Is it OK? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. I think it was a very good discussion. Thank you very much for the opportunity to have this discussion with you. We'll try to see if it is possible in the future to publish in Portuguese your book because it's a very good book. Okay. And Thank we'll be in much. touch. Thank you very much for everyone for being here. We'll be in touch and have a nice weekend. Okay. Thank you. Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.